Amen. 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 It's good to sing that together. How great thou art then sings my soul. I think it's important to remember what we're actually saying there, right? Um, Our entire being in response to the glory of God demonstrated in Christ Jesus should sing. Our souls should cry out, right? Like that should be, it's not just some mere emotional experience, but in view of the gospel, in view of the freedom that we have in Christ, we ourselves, our entire being ought to be here singing, proclaiming. Uh, of the grace and the mercy that we've received in Jesus. So it's good to sing that this morning. Um, The children all the way up through age 12 may be dismissed uh, to Children's Church, and the rest of you may be seated. Uh, If you brought your Bible this morning, and I hope that you did, uh, please take it out and turn over to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 12 and following. Uh, This morning, uh, if you didn't bring your Bible, I'd invite you to use one of the Bibles that we have available to you uh, under the seat in the row in front of you. Uh, If you use that Bible, uh, we'll be on page 1042. 1042. Uh, Last week, we began uh, a two-part message on what is referred to as the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification. And at the beginning of that message... Uh, we looked at the fact that sanctification really has two sides to it. Uh, There's what's known as positional sanctification and also progressive sanctification. So positional sanctification is the fact that when you believed in Christ Jesus, God set you apart and declared you to be holy unto the Lord. If you are in Christ, no matter how you feel at this moment, you are, by God's grace, in view of Christ Jesus, holy. You are holy. And because that is dependent on the person of Christ and his work and not your performance, nothing can change that. You are positionally holy in Christ. That's one side of sanctification, all right? Um, Last week, though, we focused, and we're going to continue to focus this week on the other side of sanctification, and that's what's known as progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification. Last week, we defined that this way. Uh, Progressive sanctification is the process by which the believer, having been justified, grows in holiness through the power of God's Spirit and the grace of his word, therefore becoming more like Jesus. Progressive sanctification refers to the process of becoming holy in the here and now by the power of God's spirit. And so if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your life ought to look different today than it did last week or last month or last year, or by God's grace, five years ago, you as a child of God, by the grace of his spirit and the power of his word, are being brought into conformity to the likeness of Christ Jesus. You are becoming holy. That's what this is all about. That's what we're after this morning. But we know that process, number one, there's joy in it, but it's all, it also can be at times uh, quite difficult. The journey of progressing through life and being brought into conformity with Jesus is often not easy. At times, though there is and can be joy through it all, it's often filled with success and certainly is filled with the freedom from sin, but also at times difficulty, trial, and even for the follower of Jesus, failure. Um, As I was studying that this week, uh, I was reminded of the old Rich Mullins song, uh, for those of you who are old enough to know who he is, um, songs uh, by his we sung in youth group when I was in high school. Um, One of those is a song called Sometimes by Step, and uh, Mullins writes this, he says, and on this road to righteousness, sometimes the climb can be so steep, I may falter in my steps, but never beyond your reach. And so as we remember that this journey that is progressive sanctification is at times incredibly steep, incredibly difficult, and at times we do fail, we remember all the way back to chapter 1 in Philippians, verse 6, where God promised, he said, he who began a good work in you is faithful and will carry that work to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Though we may slip, though we may fall, we're never 
beyond his reach if we are genuinely a follower of his. And that should provide us great comfort as we progress in our sanctification. And so before we go any further, would you pray with me? And then we're going to get right into the text. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for your spirit who guides us into truth, who progresses us in holiness, who points us to Jesus. And Father, I would pray that as I preach the word this morning, that you would fill me with your spirit, that I would proclaim it accurately and boldly as I ought to, uh, that these words would be clear and they would be used by your spirit uh, to accomplish what you've purposed today. And that all of our lives, having been here and gathered to hear your word proclaimed, would be changed for your glory and our joy more into the likeness of Jesus. So we pray that all in his name. Amen. Well, as we continue this message, as we continue looking at the progress of sanctification in our own lives, this morning we're going to focus on five truths that we need to remember as we progress in sanctification. And these aren't five truths that I've just made up or that I thought would be good to look at today. These are five truths drawn right from the text in verses 12 and following. And so if you're in the habit of taking notes, uh, you can begin here. If you're not in the habit of taking notes, I would encourage you to get there. Um, But we're going to start with this truth this morning. Five truths to remember as we progress in sanctification, starting here. Number one, the journey has a destination. The journey has a destination. This journey of sanctification is headed somewhere, and headed somewhere certain. Uh, Look with me at verse 12 in Philippians chapter 3. Paul writes this. This is God's holy word. Not that I, Paul says, have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Jesus Christ. Christ. Um, Note that interesting phrase there at the end of verse 12, because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. The ESV translates that because Jesus Christ has made me his own. Uh, The KJV says that I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Um, Perhaps you remember the story of Paul's conversion uh, recorded in Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9. I'm going to turn there. If you'd like to join me, you're more than welcome to do that. You don't have to. Um, But Paul, in the story of his conversion, is recorded in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Uh, Speaking of being apprehended by or taken hold of by Christ Jesus, we read this in verse 1 of Acts chapter 9. Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if... Um, He found any men or women who belonged to the way. That's how the first followers of Christ were referred to. They were followers of the way in in view of Jesus saying that he was the way or is the way, the truth and the life. That Paul or Saul might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Continuing in verse 3. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see. So they took him by the hand and led him into into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. Um, uh, pro tip here as we look at that story of Saul or Paul in Acts chapter 9. This is just an aside. This is free. Um, you may have heard that it was said that at this moment in Saul's life that God changed Saul's name to Paul. Um, and actually the text doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, he's still referred to as Saul. You can check this in your own Bible. Uh, immediately after his conversion and through the text all the way up, to chapter 13, verse 9, where the text of Scripture says, Saul, who was also called Paul. Um, God didn't change his name from Saul to Paul uh, at his conversion. 
Um, rather, what's going on there is that Saul and some of you who uh, are from a different culture might know some of this in your own life. Um, Saul had two different names. Uh, Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul, he lived in a primarily Greek context at this point, was his Greek name. So um, his name wasn't changed. Uh, it was both Saul and Paul. But all of that to say, Saul, who was also called Paul, had a dramatic conversion experience with the risen Lord Jesus. Paul was just going about his way, doing his normal thing, and as 9-1 says in the book of Acts, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, trying to get info on these disciples of Jesus in order to apprehend them and put them in prison. And Jesus was like, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to apprehend you, Paul. And having been taken a hold of by Jesus, the journey of knowing Jesus, his Lord, began. The destination that we are traveling toward is the glory and the goal of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, commentators Hawthorne and Martin note regarding this, to know the incompre incomprehensible greatness of Christ demands a lifetime of arduous inquiry. Say that one more time. To know the incomprehensible greatness of Christ demands a lifetime of arduous inquiry. That is, the journey toward the knowledge of Jesus Christ after having been apprehended by him or taken a hold of by him involves effort, arduous and strenuous effort. And that's what Paul says here in verse 12. Look at the text. Paul says, I make every effort to take hold of it. Would you say that you could describe your Christian life? Could I describe my Christian life in this way? My journey, am I making every effort to know Christ Jesus, my Lord? Are there, are there things that I do that you do intentionally to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ? Are you reading and studying your Bible regularly? Uh, you heard an announcement here just at the beginning of the service about the women's ministry. Uh, they've been recently going through, there was a book discussion uh, of a book called Women of the Word. It's a book by Jen Wilkin, and it's basically a book just about how to study your Bible. And through Susan, I've heard the testimonies of so many women who've been involved in that study, and they're like, how come it's taken me 20, 30, 40, or even 60 years for me to learn this? I mean, it's one thing for me to read my Bible, but I've never considered actually how to study my Bible, or even more than that, that I can. And that I can, when I study it, know what it means. I can interpret it properly, and then I can apply it to my life. Why has it taken me this long to get there? You can be there now. You can grow in that now. And are you reading and studying your Bible regularly? That's part of the process of growing in Christ's likeness. That's part of the process of sanctification. Are you in the habit? Am I in the habit of taking spiritual inventory? Meaning asking myself intentional questions and not being afraid of the answer. How am I doing? How am I growing? What what needs to still change in my life? What sin, as we talked about last week, needs to be killed? Am I regularly confessing and repenting of sin? Do you, do I consider prayer as a priority in our lives? Are we, in, are we establishing intentional relationships that will push and encourage and keep us accountable in our relationship with Christ? More on that in just a little bit. But in your life, in my life, if they were to be examined, would one of the conclusions be, yeah, this person is making every effort to go on, to grow, to know Christ Jesus. One of the joys of Christian discipleship is knowing that we aren't commanded to know and be like Christ and then left to ourselves. Um, remember, we've already heard in our study of Philippians so far, chapter 1, verse 6, I just mentioned it a moment ago. God's word says, I am sure of this. That he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1.29 said, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him. Chapter 2 verse 13 says, For it is God 
who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. And here in chapter 3, verse 12, we make every effort to take hold of Jesus and we can do that with confident expectation that good results will follow. Why? Because he first took hold of or apprehended us. He first made us his own. We can grow in grace because we have first received grace. Maybe you've tried that. Maybe you've considered that truth and encountered discouragement along the way. Maybe you've allowed the enemy to hold the failures of your past, or perhaps the sin of your present, your weaknesses, in your face, And convince you that there's no way you'll continue to make progress or actually be able to grow in holiness. Really in any meaningful way for that matter. Look at what Paul says here as we move to verses 13 and 14. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Paul is on this journey. He's still a work in progress. You and I are still works in progress. That is said, um, pardon me, that is not said, rather, to excuse or condone the sin that yet remains in our life. Just because we are works in progress, we don't sin and be like, well, I'm a work in progress, and so you should just expect me to sin all the time because I'm still a work in progress. No, we don't use that as as an excuse to sin, but it should encourage us to press on, to keep going, to strive or strain strain forward. And that's what Paul does here at the end of verse 13. He says, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. That word translated reaching forward, it actually carries with it the picture of if you've ever watched a race, like a foot race, um, track and field in the Olympics. At the end of the race, especially as it relates to like sprinting in track and field, they don't just like casually cross the finish line, right? Like as they get there, and especially if there are those to their right or to the left, they do everything they can, even by their nose, to strain forward, to reach forward, to strive forward in order to finish the race. If you are a Christian, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, your past and all the sin, no matter how messy, how deep, how complicated, or even how heinous, has been paid for. By Jesus. It has been set aside and nailed to the cross, according to Colossians 2.14. There is now no condemnation for you who is in Christ Jesus, according to Romans 8.1. You are free from the guilt and the shame and the weight of your past because of what Jesus has done. It is all under the blood, so you are able to run, forget what lies behind, and strain forward to what lies ahead. And look what Paul says there again in verse 14. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Some translations actually translate that the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And the picture is that you and I would get our eyes off of ourselves and off of our past and look up. One of the most discouraging things that we can do is be morbidly introspective. Now, I'm not saying that it's not important to examine ourselves. I just talked about that a moment ago. Are you and am I doing spiritual inventory, asking hard questions of ourselves and of our sanctification and not being afraid of the answer, but using that as, as, a, as a means to grow in Christ's likeness? But we can become habitually centered upon ourselves. We start to only ever examine ourselves. We start to only ever look inward and we're not considering the heavenly call or the upward call of God in Christ Jesus meant to ultimately get our eyes off of ourselves and on to Jesus. The Scottish Presbyterian pastor Robert Murray McShane said of this so wonderfully. Listen to his words. Learn much of the Lord Jesus, McShane said. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty, and yet such meekness and grace, and all for sinners, even the chief, 
Live much in the smiles of God. Bask in his beams. Feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. Cry after divine knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding. Let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Jesus and all that is in him, McShane says. And he concludes this way. Let the Holy Spirit fill every chamber of your heart so there will be no room for foolishness or the world or Satan or the flesh. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Jesus, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to what is ahead. We consider the upward call of God, the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Well, as we move forward, Paul's going to guard against an error that people sometimes make when it comes to the process of sanctification and our progress along the journey. Read with me in verses 15 and 16 of Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have obtained. Write this second important point to remember as we progress in sanctification. You can write this down. Number two, we have not arrived. We have not arrived. Arrived. The striking thing that Paul says here is that one of the signs that you're making progress in the journey of sanctification or of maturing in Christ is an increased understanding of how far you and I still have to go in the journey. That is, the more mature you, come, you become in Christ, the more you realize, I got a long way to go. You know, as, um, I think back to my time in school and particularly in my my graduate program at Wheaton. And uh, by God's grace, I was able to study under a a man named Douglas Moo, uh, amazing New Testament scholar. And Doug Moo has written more um, professionally and academically published on the book of Romans than anyone in all of church history. And he, having progressed that far in his understanding and knowledge of the book of Romans, isn't like... Yeah, pretty much got that figured out. No. Moo, if he were to here today and were to talk to you, he would say, man, the more that I know about that book, the more I realize there is to learn. The more that I realize I don't know. Because it's God's word. It's infinitely deep, infinitely applicable to our lives. And for all that Doug Moo has progressed in, in terms of his knowledge of the book of Romans, it's only served to help him understand there's so much more that I need to study. There's so much more that I need to know. And that's same with us in the process of sanctification. The more mature that we become in Christ, the more we realize, I got a long way to go. The ESV Study Bible offers an interesting insight regarding the word translated mature in this verse, in verse 15. Uh, it's the Greek word teleos. The same word translated perfect back up in verse 12 if you see that there in your Bible. And remember, Paul noted that he in fact was not perfect in verse 12. He says, not that I have reached the goal or am already perfect. So in effect, what he's saying here in verse 15 is that those who are truly mature or perfect, as that word can be translated, will understand that they in fact aren't perfect, but still have a long way to go. And it really is that way. Maybe you know a little bit of that. As we come to know God more deeply, we, as I've said, understand more fully his character, majesty, and holiness. We recognize how much we actually fall short. The gap between God's holiness and the understanding of how much we still need to grow only seems to get wider and wider. It's really a peculiar process that we go through along the road of sanctification. One that very well could result in discouragement or maybe even being derailed from the purpose to progress and sanctification. Jerry Bridges, in his excellent book, The Pursuit of Holiness, talks about this in chapter 10. He makes this statement. As we grow in the knowledge of God's holiness, even though we are also growing in the practice of holiness, it seems the gap between our knowledge and our practice always gets wider. This is the Holy Spirit's way, Bridges says, of drawing us more and more into holiness. Maybe to say it simply, when we understand that we haven't arrived, or that perhaps that through our ongoing battle with sin we are reminded that we haven't arrived, 
we never use that as an opportunity to give up. Proverbs 24, 16 says, Though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get up, but the wicked will stumble into ruin. The true believer, understanding that they haven't arrived, indwelt by God's Spirit, does not give up. But when they do sin, they do get up, as this proverb says, And what does that mean, really, to get up and keep going? When the righteous person falls seven times, he will get up. Uh, I wrote down these three things. This is what it looks like as a believer to, to get up and to keep going. Number one, you confess your sin. You make no excuses for it, but you confess your sin. Uh, The New Testament word for confession is the word homilageo, and it means literally to say the same thing. Sometimes when we think about getting up and confessing our sin, we say, yeah, I I get it, I sinned, it was a sin. Okay, I'm not making any excuses, that was a sin. But that's not what saying the same thing means. To say the same thing about our sin, at least as the New Testament describes it, is to say the same thing that God does about your sin and make no excuses for it. So I am saying that what I've done is sin. It is utterly sinful. It is abhorrent to the Lord. I want no room for it in my life. I'm admitting that I did it. I'm making no excuse for it. And I want to move on from it. I'm confessing my sin. And then I'm turning from it. I'm repenting of it. And repentance involves both a turn and a change of mind. So the righteous person, when they fall, they get up. They say, I sinned. It's terrible. I make no excuses. I'm getting up. I'm turning from it. I'm changing my mind about it. It's abhorrent to me. It's repulsive to me. I want nothing to do with it anymore. And I'm turning toward Jesus. My mind changes regarding it. I'm no longer going toward it. I'm going 180 degrees away from it. I confess and I repent and then I move forward. I don't stay there. But by God's grace, I keep going. Now, oddly enough, there are some who profess to be Christians that actually do think that they've arrived. They believe that for all intents and purposes, they are perfect and that they no longer sin. This false and unbiblical teaching is known as sinless perfectionism. And it is actually taught in branches of Wesleyan, Pentecostal, and Keswick thought. It's the idea that a person can fully eradicate the presence and practice of sin in this life and be perfectly holy and without any further sin at all. And while it sounds noble and good, it is not consistent with the teaching of Scripture. And actually it breeds a form of pride and self-righteousness that is not consistent with the gospel. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, and that's in the present, If I say I have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.15, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and Paul says, I am the worst of them. Pay close attention to that. He didn't say that he was the worst of them. He says, full stop, present tense, I am the worst of them. And I think if we're we're actually thinking about this, we might say, how could that be? How on earth is Paul qualified to lead, to teach, to call others to repentance if he, in fact, is the very worst of sinners? I mean, like, this is Paul. He, of all people, is sold out for, at least he says he is, the glory of God, the advance of the gospel for pressing on to know Jesus and having a life filled with joy. He's got to be close to perfect at this point. Paul says, no, I'm not perfect. Actually, far from it. Remember, actually, he referred to himself as a wretched man in Romans chapter 7. What Paul is saying here in 1 Timothy 1.15 is that as he continues to understand the mercy of God and grows in Christ's likeness, he is personally acquainted with the depth of his own sin. He sees it ever more accurately as he progresses or grows in holiness. He also addresses it here at the end of verse 15, pardon me, in the book of uh, Philippians, Philippians 3.15. And it's actually kind of humorous what he does. Um, He's basically saying that if you, for whatever reason, didn't get the memo, and you think, yeah, I'm I'm arrived, I've arrived, I'm perfect. He says, no, you've got a long way to go. Look at the text there. In verse 15, he says, if you think differently about anything, that is, what he just said in verses 12 through 15, if you're not on the same page with me, 
God will reveal this to you also. Remember a verse we mentioned last week, John 16, 8, which teaches that one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to reveal and convict us of sin that still remains in us. If the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you because you are in Christ, he will reveal to you the sin that still remains. And what a grace that truly is to us. And Paul goes on here in verse 16, and look what he says. He says, in any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. And this is a good reminder on two fronts. I wrote them down. Number one, everyone is at a different place along the journey of sanctification. Everyone is at a different place along the journey of sanctification. Some are further along. Some are just getting started. All of us in Christ are new creations and should be living as such, yet we should be gracious and patient with everyone and encourage them to keep pressing on toward holiness. Each case, in each case, in any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have obtained. Um, the second thing I wrote down, I should be more concerned with where I am in the journey and how I am living than overtly focusing on how others around me are doing. It doesn't mean that I'm not concerned with how those around me are doing. But my concern lies primarily with me. I can encourage those around me, but I cannot control them. And sometimes, in an effort to look over our own sin, we become overtly focused on the sin of others. And so in this case, we should be more concerned with where we are, living up to the truth that we have obtained, attained, how we are living and um, how we are doing, rather than focusing on those around us and ultimately how they are doing. We can really see in the text that much is to be said here actually to the believing community. Paul is continually addressing the brothers and sisters. He says that in verse 15. Um, In verse 15, he also says all of us, and we should be living in a particular way in verse 15. It's extremely uh, important to remember that we are not on this journey of progressive sanctification alone. See that, brothers and sisters, we, all of us. Um, Look at verse 17 in particular here. God's word says, Paul says particularly, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters. There it is again. And pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. Uh, Note this third truth to remember as we progress in sanctification. Um, Community is essential. Community is essential. Paul calls the believers to imitate his way of life as he follows Jesus. It's something that he actually mentions elsewhere. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul similarly says, follow me as I follow Christ. The picture is that of an intermediate goal. Sometimes the journey of sanctification can seem really like climbing Mount Everest, quite overwhelming and maybe seeming to be somewhat impossible. Anyone who has ever reached the summit of Mount Everest will tell you that they didn't just simply say, all right, like, <laughs> give me a couple hours, I'll get there, right? Like it wasn't that at all. Anybody who has ever successfully made that ascent to the summit of Everest will tell you that it was only done by setting intermediate goals. Today, we're getting from here to here. And once we get to there, we're going to go from there to there. And then so on and so forth. The journey of sanctification is the same way. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. That is like, I'm not thinking like, you know, five, ten years down the road right now, I'm thinking I'm dependent on grace for the next 58 minutes. God, get me there. And once I get there, I'll give you all the glory. And then I'll focus on the next hour. And then the next hour. And then the next hour. And even as I grow and I progress in sanctification, I'm not thinking, man, yes, I want to be more like Jesus. I'm really not matching up too well with that. Who around me 
is further along in this journey than I am? Who can I look to? Who can I follow? Whose life is a pattern that I might try to match up with as they follow Christ? I'm setting myself intermediate goals. I'm not doing this thing that is the Christian life alone. Indeed, it was never intended to be lived alone. I mean, think for just a moment about the one and other commands in Scripture. They point to this very fact that Christianity and living the Christian life is community-oriented. The word translated one another in Scripture, actually in the New Testament, appears 100 times. And of those 100 uses of the word translated one another, 59 of those talk about how to and how not to relate to one another. Some of these you might know. Love one another. Accept one another. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Serve one another. Be devoted to one another. Submit to one another. Do not lie to one another. Do not grumble against each other. Do not provoke to envy one another. We seek to obey and emphasize the necessity, benefits, the call to community here at Faith in particular, actually through Um, not only membership, which is a good thing to pursue, it's a good thing to become a member, but also small groups. I had a great meeting with the small group leaders after the service last week, and they're actually going to be officially launching for this ministry year next week. And so if you're not in a group, I would encourage you to head out to the table in the lobby and sign up for a group that has a slot available. Uh, But one of the ways that I encouraged the small group leaders last week was drawing from a resource entitled Why Small Groups... And I wanted to encourage you with those as well. I wanted to tell you, and I think this is important for us at Faith Bible Church, and as we consider small groups, as we consider living in Christian community, I don't want to hear at Faith merely have small groups. I also don't want to merely offer small groups. I want us to be a church that is literally built from small groups. Now, why would that be important? Why would that be something that would be good to pursue? Well, I said this to the leaders as well. Our small groups are not just social clubs to get together once a week and talk about whatever. But they're going to be focused on or characterized by four very specific and intentional things. The first one is the sanctification which we're talking about right now, of every person in the group. One of the reasons that you join a small group is the hope that through the small group and the ministry to and from one another, you will be sanctified. You will grow in Christ's likeness. That's the first purpose. The second purpose is that we would be mutually caring for one another, right? It's not just a mere social club, but we are there because we love the people who are a part of our group and we expect to and ought to expect to, because we're brothers and sisters in Christ, be loved by them as well. Sanctification, mutual care. Number three, fellowship and partnership in the gospel, right? As we are with these people in the small group environment, we recognize that we hold the same values in Christ, that we are partners in the advancement of the gospel. And we consider how can our group be used as one tiny part of Faith Bible Church for the advancement and the spread of the gospel. It might be having a small group dinner where everybody in the group says, I'm going to invite one neighbor over to this cookout at my small group leader's house, and we are going to intentionally love on these people, show them hospitality, and share with them the good news of the gospel because we together in this group are partners in the advancement of the gospel. And finally, the fourth characteristic, being a place where we can regularly experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit in and toward each other through the use of our gifts. Small groups are a great way to experience biblical community. And that we would be committed to that and have that commitment here. And a specific reason for having those as believers in this church is that we would grow with um, and be with one another for the advancement of the gospel. Are you benefiting from and committed to living in gospel-focused community for the benefit of others? It's vital to our sanctification. And well, that community of people would be uh, for us. There also does exist a collective, a community of people around us that is opposed to sanctification. And perhaps opposed to our sanctification, the gospel, and the glory of Christ. Look at the text here in verses 18 and 19 as we continue. For I have often told you and now say again with tears, 
that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. And they are focused on earthly things. Make note of this, the fourth thing to remember as we progress in sanctification. The opposition will continue. The opposition will continue. There will always be those who live in rebellion to the gospel. What Paul is saying here could be speaking of the Judaizers, those who rebel against the gospel by demanding that something be added to it in order for it to be effective, in order to be saved, namely, in their case, observance to the law through circumcision. Or he may be speaking of overall rebellion and unbelief in general. Um, Interpreters are divided on that, um, but I think the principle of application is the same either way. As Christians on this side of glory, we will continue to live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Paul noted that in chapter 2, verse 15. Don't miss, though, Paul's attitude toward them. It moves him, the text says, those who are in opposition to the gospel. Their very existence, their rebellion against the gospel moves him, the text says, to the point of tears. To see people living as enemies of the cross. We ought to be grieved to see people live in opposition to Christ and make every effort to proclaim to them the gospel. But the truth is, especially when the road to sanctification proves to be difficult and trying, that we end up not being grieved by the wicked, but instead we're drawn away, enticed by what seems to be the ease, the comfort, And the false joy of those who live for themselves. The psalmist Asaph experienced this. It's recorded in Psalm 73. Listen to what he said. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. For I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die. Their bodies are well fed. They're not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. They set their mouths against heaven. Their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to them and drink in their overflowing words. That is, they're enticed by them. They're taken away by them. And the wicked say, verse 11 says, How can God know? Does the Most High know everything? Look at them, the wicked. They're always at ease. And they increase in their wealth. Wouldn't it just be easier to give up and to walk in the way of the wicked? Is the whole pursuit of Christ and at times the difficulty of the journey of sanctification really worth it? Asaph in Psalm 73 asks that question. He says in verse 13, Did I purify my heart and wash my hands in innocence for nothing? For I'm afflicted all day long and punished every morning. So I'm still dealing with difficult things every single day. Didn't Jesus like come into the world? And of course, he's not saying this particularly, but, but we often think in view of that, didn't he come to make me healthy, wealthy, and wise? Didn't he come to take away all my sickness and all my troubles? And if I really have faith in him, shouldn't my life just be easy all the time? I mean, if God was really powerful, he would do that for me, right? We think like that. But look what Asaph concludes when he gets his mind focused on truth. When I tried to understand this, Asaph says in verse 16 of Psalm 73, it seemed hopeless until I entered God's sanctuary. Then I understood their destiny. Indeed, you put them in slippery places. You make them fall into ruin. How suddenly they become a desolation. They come to an end, swept away by terrors. This is what Paul says of those who live in opposition to Christ in the gospel. In verse 19, look at the text again. He says, their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame and they are focused on earthly things. Their end is destruction. Salvation comes only through Christ, not through supposed freedom or the supposed freedom of satisfying my every desire and pleasure. Their God is their stomach. That is their own pleasures and appetites, which they never satisfy. They're after those things, but they'll only ever get hungry again. Their glory is in their shame. What they boast about now will be a source of shame for them before the judgment seat of Christ. 
They're focused on earthly things. Their minds are only considering the here and now, not where they will be in 100 years. Why would I say that? I would say that because of this. Because the only thing that will matter to you and matter to me 100 years from September 10th, 2023, for every single person in this room, is what you did with Jesus Christ. What you did with him is the only thing that you will be concerned about at that point. And so what have you done with him? Have you turned to him? Have you trusted in him? Are you following after him? Are you desiring and striving to be more like him? Have you bowed the knee to him? Well, as we draw to a close today, please look with me at verse 20 through chapter 4, verse 1. God's word says this, and this will conclude our passage for the day. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, there it is again, my joy and crown in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Our final point, our final thing to remember as we progress in sanctification today is this, our glorification is certain. Our glorification is certain. We can press on with assurance along the journey towards sanctification because we know that the end of the journey by God's grace is certain. The Bible teaches that the risen and reigning Lord Jesus will return in great power and in great glory to judge the living and the dead. And whatever else you believe about the specifics of how that event will take place, all Christians agree and indeed must agree on that major point of doctrine. After Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, he ascended into heaven in his glorified body that he had when he rose from the dead. We read of this in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. The text says, after he said this, that's promising the Spirit, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way you have seen him going into heaven. At his return, the promise that we have in Scripture is that we will receive an immortal body like his glorified body. This, in a sense, this glorification is the culmination of our sanctification. Of this moment, Scriptures tell us that the dead in Christ will rise first and their soul will be reunited with a new body. Those who remain at the Lord's coming will meet the Lord in the air and be changed in the blink of an eye. You can read more about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. But this is a good opportunity as we close. Um, it's a good point for clarification. Something we've talked about before, but something that is often misunderstood. When we die, our body goes into the ground and our soul goes to be with the Lord. The great majority of those who are in heaven with the Lord do not have a physical body right now. Their souls are awaiting, they're there awaiting the return of Christ and the final resurrection. According to scripture, there are only three individuals right now who have physical bodies in heaven. Enoch, Genesis 5, 24 says, Enoch walked with God and then was not there because God took him. Additionally, uh, Hebrews 11, 5 says, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he he did not experience death. So Enoch still has a body, presumably, the one that he had here on earth. Elijah also, 2 Kings 2, 11 and 12 says, as they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. That's Elijah and Elisha. Then Elijah went up into heaven in the whirlwind and Elisha watched. And of course, Jesus. So we've got Enoch, Elijah, And Jesus, the eternal Son of God, is now forever the God-man. His resurrection body, his glorified body, the one he possesses now, is like the body we ourselves will receive at his return. It is incorruptible, immortal, completely free from sin, and indeed not able to sin. 
Any infirmity or ailment we suffered with here on earth will not be so with our resurrection body. The deaf will hear, the blind will see, the mute will talk, the lame will walk. We shall be glorified and conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And what that moment will be like when we receive our glorified bodies isn't fully known. But the certainty of that event is. And that, the scripture says, should make a sanctifying difference in the way we choose to live right now. Listen to the words of 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. God's word says, Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he, that's Christ, appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And then the sanctifying benefit of that, and everyone who has this hope, that hope longing for the return of Christ to be made fully into his image, purifies himself just as he is pure. So because our glorification is certain, we press on in obedient, holy living today. How? How do we know that this event really is certain? With that, I would invite the band to come back up at this time. Look at the conclusion of verse 21. How will this be accomplished? The text says, by the power that enables him, that is Jesus, to subject everything to himself. Psalm 110 verse 1 and 1 Corinthians 15 25 tell us that we are racing toward a day when all things will be put in subjection to King Jesus. Indeed, all his enemies, as those texts say, will be made a footstool for his feet. So the question is, what difference does that make for me and for you today? Look at our final verse, chapter 4 verse 1. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm, continue in faith, press on in holiness, pursue with concentrated effort and purpose your sanctification. Don't be swayed or tempted by the world. Rest in Christ if you are a believer. For the unbeliever here, What difference does all of this make? I would say this to you. Flee to Christ today. Be free from the guilt, the shame, and the weight of your sin. Cast yourself upon the Lord Jesus and find his forgiveness to be free and full even to the chief of sinners. Turn from your sin and believe in Jesus. His grace is sufficient to you. And for the unbeliever, I would say, do not wait, do not delay, do not hesitate, for the day is coming when his enemies will be made his footstool. And so I urge you, know what it is not to be his footstool, but to find him sufficient and to satisfy you and to save you to the uttermost. Bow to him as Lord and God. Would all of you bow with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that you have not left us alone on this journey of sanctification. But as we've learned from the book of Philippians, the very power that has raised Jesus from the dead is working in us, namely the person of the Holy Spirit. We know certainly that the resurrection was a Trinitarian act, but Father, we ask that you would help us to be people who are dependent upon your Spirit for life and to grow and to change and to be moved forward in holiness, that we would not be content to stay as we are, but that we, for your glory and our joy, would consider our sanctification every day, that we would be free from the weight of sin, and that we would find joy and fullness and obedience to Christ and Christ-likeness in our own lives. So God, empower us for that. Be glorified as you are the one who both wills and works the good that is in us to the praise of your glorious grace. We pray that all in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship?